You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Common Descent Podcast. This is a podcast about paleontology, life history, the history of stuff on the planet Earth, and sometimes elsewhere. <laughs> this is episode 160, and we are talking about the Messel Pit. A mess of a pit. It, it is? Well, yeah, it's, it's, you, we'll find out. <laughs> We've done a bunch of episodes in the past about specific fossil localities. This is a European one, which we haven't really done oh Uh, true funnily enough we have not done a ton of episodes centered in europe we've done some yeah we have not done a ton which is weird given that so much paleontology and paleontology history happens in europe that's one like i that had not clicked until you said that but Mm -hmm. yeah huh Huh. yep it's a small place (laughs) yeah Eh, not much interesting there (laughs) uh the messel pit is a exquisite fossil site one of the world's most famous fossil sites and has produced some of the world's most famous fossils Located in Germany, we have talked about the Messel Pit on the podcast a bunch of times because we talk about paleontology and that tends to happen. Yes. It's that kind of fossil site. In this episode, after the news, after the announcements, once we get into the main thing, we will talk about what the site is, how it formed, get some history in there, and then go over just a bunch of the cool stuff that has been found at that particular site. That's always one of the fun things about fossil site episodes is we get to do the the like walk of fame through like here here are just the ones that have kind of put it on the map over and over yeah well and and this is a particularly interesting one because this is the kind of site where i couldn't list all the good stuff that's come out of this site yeah which means that by necessity we have to just kind of pick and choose which means that we get to pick and choose yay this topic as all of our topics was requested this one a request came to us from leo lydia carl august and steven of the valley Nice. Thank you, everybody, for those requests. We hope you enjoy. Before we get into any of the main meat of the episode, just a few announcements. Announcement number one, we have a Patreon. Mm -hmm. The Patreon helps us to support all of the things that we do. The podcast, our hosting the podcast, our website, all of our special projects and stuff that we do every now and then. All of that is possible thanks to the support we get on Patreon. Thank you to all of our patrons. Those who support us get all sorts of cool goodies, bonus content, director's notes. We do live streams uh, once a month these days. And at a certain level, we will shout your name out on the podcast. This episode, we would like to welcome new patrons Ryan, Donna, Ali, Maya, and Sleep Demons. <laughs> Thank you all for supporting us. Thanks to all of our patrons, old and new and future. Mm -hmm. That's you, listener. (laughs) We hope. Uh, Speaking of which, there's all sorts of other ways you can support the podcast and engage with us. We have a Discord now, which has been growing steadily with all sorts of cool chats and conversations on there. Yeah. We have a bunch of social medias. We have an email address where you can reach out to us. We also have a physical mailing address. Mm -hmm. And indeed... We got some mail recently. We did. We got mail from Mark, who sent a very nice letter, which we we very much appreciate. And then these neat little, uh, what would you call these? They're little, like, fossil holographic uh, valentine cards. Yeah, yeah. Uh, One has a mosasaur, one has the metrodon, and it's the, you know, if you turn it, you get to see their skeleton or their skin. Yeah, very cool. It's neat. These are super neat. Thank you very much, Mark. Hey, listener, if you would like to engage with any of that kind of stuff, Check out all the links in the episode description. All sorts of ways that you can support us financially, support us morally, philosophically, yes. <laughs> in our heart. <laughs> Check that all out. And hey, also one other thing. Every now and then, sometimes, uh, you can come support us in person. Uh, we are making at least a couple of appearances at special places this year. Mm-hmm. We're not talking about Dragon Con yet, although, you know, stay tuned in a few months. <laughs> we'll talk about Dragon Con. Our local university, ETSU is hosting a con at the very start of April. Uh, ETSU con, I think they call it ITSUCon. Uh, Yep, yep. If I read the pronunciation guide on the website correctly. (laughs) We will both be presenting at ITSUCon as representing the podcast and the Gray Fossil Site and Museum. We've got three panels slated to go. Uh, Should we announce the panels? Yeah, I think we should announce the panels. The titles of our panels are Speculative Evolution, Mm -hmm. because of course... Pokemon Extinction, which I'm very excited about, 
and a modified version of one of the presentations we did last year at DragonCon called Jurassic Park is a Terrible Zoo. Yes. It's going to be a ton of fun if any of our listeners are in this area, uh, nearby East Tennessee. Come check it out. Itsukan is April 1st and 2nd, and we are on the, the, the docket. We are on the schedule. Yeah, I'm, it's, I'm excited. It is always fun getting to talk at conventions. And man, when it's in walking distance, that's... Oh yeah, this is oh, fantastic. I, I just have to get dressed. <laughs> and then you know, walk out the door take a stroll <laughs> it is so so easy it is not too bad <laughs> there should also be a gray fossil site table there uh with some fossils and stuff and some of the people from the museum so there will be all sorts of cool opportunities to engage yeah that's enough of the announcements which means that now we can move on from announcing stuff about us to start announcing stuff about science uh, every episode, we have a news section where we like to talk about news from the world of paleontology, geology related studies. I think this time around, uh, as is often the case, it's all paleontology stuff. <laughs> Will news. My first bit of news is a fossil lacewing larva. Ooh, uh, bugs. Yes. So lacewings are insects around today with Neuroptera. Yeah, Neuroptera. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Neuropterans have big transparent wings, which is what they're named for. This is a particularly large and unusual, uh, or unique at least, shaped fossil larva from this group. All right. This research is by Xu Hong Du et al. in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B, and the press release is in phys.org by Bob Yurka. So neuropterans, uh, today mostly found in North America and Europe, but used to populate many areas of, many areas of Asia, the earliest fossils of this group are known from the early Cretaceous, and already show a lot of the the taxonomic diversity that's known for this group. This new species is now currently the oldest fossil known from this group. Okay. In the Middle Jurassic, found from Mongolia in China. This species is Paleoneurorthus bii. There's one too many R's. Yep, it is an extra (laughs) hidden R in there. This is a... As it was described in the abstract, giant lacewing larva. Yeah, eat your cat. It is it is notably sized for, compared to others and unusually shaped. It has some interesting morphologies. I don't actually know what a lacewing larva looks like off the top of my head. Because yeah. Because I only ever think of adults mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. most insects. So they are one of the groups that has predatory larva oh, that cool. live in water. Like a dragonfly. Like a dragonfly, yes. Mm. So this isn't like a grub. No, this thing has, it has a very clear face with chompers for oh, catching cool. prey. So when I said eat your cat, I yeah, was actually right? <laughs> closer than I thought that I was. And that's something that all lacewing larvae, uh, to my knowledge, they all have these stylets that are their mandible-esque yeah. things to grab prey and, you know, hunt in the water. This specimen was notable for being one, large, and having a long body. Uh, they noted that this is very adequate support already, that it is l- very likely predatory because it was big and big larva very often tend to lean that way. It also had some notable stylets, so it had the grabbers. They were straight and then curved at the tips that were on the head, which was on the end of a very long, quote-unquote, neck, the cervix, hmm. which is the neck-like section yeah. of elongated. They compared it to a giraffe. Oh, weird. They said it was this long, t- telescoped, periscoped neck with the head on the end that was at a length of 41.2 millimeters. Whoa. Yeah. For recording the weather, as yes. we discussed <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> in the previous episode. For peeking out above the water. <laughs> <laughs> they said that this very likely could be an adaptation for hunting that could let them like hide behind rocks or plants and then pop the head up to either look for prey or grab prey mm-hmm. and giving them a, a, a more low profile for their large body. From the sound of the description in the abstract, it seemed like this is a fairly unique body shape for lacewing larvae. They were also able to note from uh, the fossil and, and the sediment, the environment it was found in, which does support a link environment, uh, which they are aquatic larvae today, but typically they're found in streams, uh, mountain streams. Hmm. And so this is a slightly different habitat. Not incredibly, but... Yeah, I I wonder if that has anything to do with the slightly different body shape. Yep. They also noted that this might indicate that there was some shift 
throughout their evolutionary history at some point that they may have been more widespread in different ecosystems or been in a slightly different aquatic ecosystem and then yeah. shifted until now modern ones are stream and, yeah. and rivulet. Or this was the super weird yes. lake version. <laughs> this is the this lake was, monster. This is the lake monster <laughs> version of a lace wing larva. Absolutely. The lace nest monster. <laughs> you can cut that out. I like it. No, I'm leaving it in. That's in there now. <laughs> And ultimately, they ended up placing it within the lace room group Nevrothidae. Also, one too many R's. Yes. Which uh, uh, suggests that at least this group has been displaying this kind of aquatic predatory behavior since the mid-Jurassic. Yep. This is one of the... We've talked about this a bunch, where it's always fun to identify the things in very ancient ecosystems that would be familiar. That you've got dinosaurs stomping around, and you've got all sorts of pterosaurs in the sky... But if you go to a lake and you look in the water, there's lacewing larvae yeah. hunting little aquatic things. Like some, th- some things are very familiar. If you use a skimmer net, like you, you know, mm-hmm. if you did, ever did that with your biology class, you'd collect similar looking things. I would love to see. We got a patron question many episodes ago where one of our patrons asked us to describe a Mesozoic tide pool. Oh, yeah. I think it would be a super cool thought experiment or activity or something to come up with some kind of description of like it, we do a skimmer net of a lake from all the different time periods. Yes. Like what would you get in the net from the Jurassic, from the Eocene, from whatever? Uh, and in the Jurassic, apparently you'd get some lace wings. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a part I always appreciate when dinosaur documentaries make a point to, to show that like, and then, you know, we come to the lake where there are crocodiles, they're different species, but, they're doing similar thing, and there's fish that are you know, different species, but a lot of the lake residents yeah. are doing the same kind of stuff so that... And then a stegosaur. Is, yeah, exactly. Like, right. the world is not wholly alien. There are recognizable roles or sometimes groups. Yes. Even if the member of that group is very strange. Yes. Well, my first bit of news is kind of related a little bit for reasons that will become apparent shortly. But for now, it's about plants. All right. And it is about an ability that plants have that we now have fossil evidence for. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, something their leaves can do. This is research in the journal Current Biology by Zhuo Feng et al. And the article that we will link to in the blog post, all these articles are linked in the blog post that you can find the link to in the episode description, is in Science News by Carolyn Grambling, plants move. This is a thing that plants do that we don't often think about plants doing, but plants have the ability to move. In particular, plant leaves and stems and flowers and stuff have a variety of ways that they can move in response to stimuli from outside. We actually talked about this a bunch in episode 105, where we talked about carnivorous plants, because carnivorous plants are, are among the most famous examples of this, where something touches the fly trap and it snaps shut. This study specifically regards a type of plant behavior called foliar nictinesty, which is the behavior where a plant's leaves will close at night. They fold over at night and then open back up in the daytime. Yeah. It's sort of the plants. They they use the phrase, the term circadian rhythm Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a couple times in the article talking about this is the day night habit of these plants. Well, and this is the same uh, uh, motion that the um oh, I forget the name of it, but the 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 fern that if you touch it. Oh yeah, when it curls back. Uh, well, it, it folds its little leaves up. Um, oh, I see. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. I see what you're it talking about. It folds them up and it it oh, it's called like the shy fern or the sensitive fern or something mm-hmm. like that. Uh there's a fun but it's it's tactile. Yep. It will it will fold up if it is bothered physically. This is a thing that plants will do. In relation to just the time of day it is. Yeah. That when it becomes nighttime, the leaves fold in half. This is thought to potentially help with temperature regulation, possibly to help with uh, shedding surface water. Uh, some things have suggested that it might be to help avoid predation, mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. you're just kind of shrinking your profile. Maybe yeah. that helps to not be noticed. This is something that lots of plants do. Uh, especially angiosperms. There are tons of angiosperms that do this, flowering plants. But fossil evidence for this kind of behavior is obviously difficult to come by. This study identifies leaf fossils from the Permian. Wow. All the way back in the Permian. These are from China uh, around 259 to 252 million years ago. So late Permian. 
with fossil evidence, evidence in the fossils, of this folding behavior. And the evidence is insect feeding damage. Oh. They noted on these leaves that there are bites, there's damage from insect feeding that is symmetrical <laughs> on the leaf <laughs> across <laughs> the center of it. And the authors have interpreted this particular pattern. These are mature leaves that should otherwise be open. This symmetrical pattern of insect feeding damage they've interpreted as because they were fed on while they were folded. Yeah. So an insect took a bite and it bit through both sides. Like you, when you do an art project. That's what I was going to say. It's like <laughs> it's a, making a folded uh, a snowflake. Yep. <laughs> and and you, you fold it and cut it. Yep. And then it's on both sides. <laughs> yeah. This is symmetrical leaf damage. The leaves themselves belong to a genus called Gigantonoclea, which is part of a group called the Gigantopterids, which were an important group of plants on land during the Permian. Their leaves are broad with serrated edges with this symmetrical feeding damage on them. The feeding damage pattern has been identified as a new ichno species. Cool. That this is something we've talked about before. Trace fossils, episode 118 often get their own species names. This ichno species, this trace species, has been named Folifenestra, Folifenestra leaf window, Folifenestra symmetrica. <laughs> it is a new ichno species, and it is based on the interpretation that the leaves were folded. That would make this the first fossil evidence of this behavior in plants. Wow, cool. This is the first time researchers have seen something and gone, that seems like it's a good indication that these plants, these leaves were doing this behavior. Yeah. Which is a very cool, it's a very fun kind of sideways way to come to this conclusion. Well, it's it's a, that fun scenario of the only explanation we can think of that would result in that damage specifically is this one particular behavior some plants do. Yes. And, and that's very cool. And there are a couple of implications and open questions. For one, as I mentioned, most of the plants that we see do this today are flowering plants, angiosperms, but these are not. Okay. This is a different group of plants, so it's possible that this behavior has originated multiple times. Mm -hmm. This might be convergent. The other thing that is still an open question is exactly how they were doing it. Modern plants, and I thought this was very cool because I didn't know that this is how plants worked. Modern plants that fold their leaves have specialized cells at the base of the leaf mm. and the the leaf can fill them with water or empty them of water and when they inflate or deflate with water it causes the leaf to fold or unfold yeah like a plant version of a muscle yeah that structure which has a name that i didn't write down is located at the base of the leaf and in these fossils the base of the leaf is not preserved okay so they okay. don't know if it if these leaves had the same structure, yeah, if the mecha- same mechanism was in yeah, use, exactly. Which, if they could find that, if there are other leaves out there that preserve that structure, it might be able to give us an extra indication of are they doing this using a very a, a similar method, or is there something weird and different about it? And could that help us to understand if this is an independent origin, yes, of this structure, or is this something that plants have just been doing way way back in their evolutionary history? Which is also a situation of both would make complete sense to me. Mm -hmm. Like if this was beneficial for plants to start doing as soon as they came on land, like, hey, the sun's here now. Like there's no water protecting you from it. You you need to do something to protect yourself or, or to take advantage of it, but then protect yourself at night, like whatever the situation was. But also that's still the case from then on, even if it didn't evolve right away. Would not surprise me at all if it came up multiple times. If the, if carnivorous plants can evolve multiple times, <laughs> surely <Why> closing. <laughs> yeah. Now, I did not notice a mention of what insects are thought to have made the traces, which is a little bit of a shame. Yeah. I would have liked to know that. Uh, it might be hidden. It might be within the paper. Yeah, this yeah. is one where I don't think I was able to get to the paper itself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But a very cool study. Also, I, I went and extra looked up, why do plants do this? And I found those three answers yeah. of could be temperature control, could be water control, and it could be to protect them from uh, being eaten. And I read that and I went, oh, well, yeah, yeah. it's not perfect if that's, <laughs> if that's one of the goals that yeah. uh, did not work for these plants. <laughs> Neat. Very cool. I have no good segue into my next one. But 
This is research about gigantism and dwarfism in theropod dinosaurs. Cool. And a attempt to try to answer the question of what was the trend in the evolution of these changes in size. Okay. Or these differentiations in size. I'm intrigued. This is research by Michael Demick at all in science. Oh, cool. Yep. We work together up at Adelphi. Oh, yeah. What's up, Mike? (laughs) He's not listening, I'm sure. Uh, It's cool research, though, so good job, Mike. Mike's just done a lot of cool stuff on theropods and sauropods. This is cool dinosaur work. This article is by Sade Agard in Interesting Engineering. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, will be in the blog post. Yep, yep, yep. So... We talked about gigantism and dwarfism. Episode 144. This is when things get particularly big or particularly small from an evolutionary perspective. Right. A lineage gets gradually yes. larger or smaller. Like elephants are big and like other stuff is yeah. small. And you can have like dwarf elephants that are particularly small species of that group or mm-hmm. particularly giant members. Or, or giant lace wings. Yes. This research was looking into the fact that We've known for a long time that dinosaurs are ridiculously diverse in their sizes, but there's been many questions as to A, why, and B, how is that difference achieved? Like, what's changing in the way the animals are growing and developing to get these differing sizes? Typically, like, like generally, the consensus usually is that it's growth rate that is... They're growing faster or slower. Exactly. Mm -hmm. To increase your size, you grow faster... That's been the, the typical school of thought, as opposed of growth duration. Instead of growing right. longer, they're growing faster. Right. So, like, we've talked before about how T-Rex grew in roughly the same pattern that humans do. Yes, exactly. Like, has a growth spurt in its teens. So T-Rex was not actually growing for a longer period of time than humans, generally speaking, but it was growing way faster. Just so fast. To put on all of that extra size. But the researchers here, this uh, uh, Mike and his dean, make the point that most of the studies that have come to that conclusion have not done a wide phylogenetic comparison. Sure. And really looked at it. It's usually been kind of uh, 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 more narrow comparisons. So they wanted to take a broad look and they use theropods because A, there's a bunch of different sizes of them. Yep. Because they go from tiny bird sized bipeds to T-Rex. Exactly. So we got a lot of different sizes and we have a diverse group, you know, a bunch of different theropods to pull on. They are looking at the growth rings in the bones. So we've talked before about many animals, especially many reptiles and archosaurs have growth cycles where they grow faster at certain times of the year and slower at certain times of the year. And these cause denser and less dense portions of the bone, like a tree ring. You can get a rough idea of growth rate and duration and cycle. Using this and looking at theropods, they looked at a total of 80 different theropod bones, measuring roughly 500 growth rings. This allowed them to get a developmental strategy comparison across these groups and they noted that this is the first large-scale phylogenetic comparative analysis of this topic so this is the first time it's been done in this particular way they reconstructed the ancestral states of these growth rates by looking at comparing what the most likely common ancestral growth rate and body mass would have been and what they found was that growth rate and duration seem to have roughly equal effects Oh. That they seem to be equally as diverse. Now, the news article put it as that they discovered there was no relationship between growth rate and body size, which is not what the abstract worded it as. Hmm. But they did make the point that they found that some big dinosaurs grew rather slowly, uh, some even slower than alligators today, while some small dinosaurs were growing very fast on like the equivalent rate of mammals. Gotcha. So there isn't a one-to-one... Yes correlation between how fast you grow and how big you get exactly okay the abstract did note though that they did find still support for a connection there but they found equal support for growth diversity of growth duration of how long they were growing changing for being an effect on size and it seems that a combination and mixture of those two are equally at fault for causing this diverse differences in dwarfism and gigantism. Interesting. So it isn't just, in order to get big, you do this one thing. There are, it sounds like, multiple different ways 
that these lineages could change their growth pattern to achieve a different size of body, you know, generations down the line. Yes, basically, uh, one of the ways they put it was it seemed equally likely that both large and small dinosaurs could have growth spurts, like you described with T-Rex, mm -hmm. could have that puberty style sudden growth spurt, that that wasn't something just for getting big. Gotcha. Little animals were also doing, little theropods at least. This is a fun kind of discussion because it does drive, we talked about this in the last episode when we talked about giraffes, how there are different patterns in different animals becoming long bodied or having long necks that some add more vertebrae mm -hmm. and some make the vertebrae longer and bigger and some do a little bit of both, that there are multiple ways to achieve having a long neck. This is a very similar story where the, there are many lineages that have grown to particularly large or small sizes. There are multiple ways to achieve that in terms of shifts to their uh, your growth pattern. And they noted that this is, there's many further questions to ask and look into about this because growth rate and duration both have multiple different implications for other life aspects of the animal. Like how many young does that mean you're more likely to have? Right. How depending. long does it take you to reach adulthood? Mm -hmm. so how much time do you spend as a, as a young version of yourself? Even potentially giving info on how, what is your likely full lifespan mm -hmm. if your growth time was this that has implications for what your lifespan or your growth rate was this that parsing these out could give us other insights into other life aspects of the animals. Yeah. Well, we've also talked about uh, ontogenetic niche partitioning. Yes. Where uh, a single animal will go through different ecological roles as it gets bigger. We always use the modern example of crocs because mm -hmm. crocs do this. And T-Rex is known, uh, well known for this hypothesis yes. and a bunch of other dinosaurs. How fast an animal is growing will also determine how long it spends in each of those roles. Yes. Like, does this animal spend a year at this sort of middle-sized predator role? Or is it there for a few years? And does that impact the ecosystem? There's all sorts of cool different questions that you can get into asking. Yeah. Well, speaking of cool different questions we can ask about dinosaurs and their lifestyles, I also have a news about dinosaurs. Uh, this, specifically, is about dinosaur noises. Hey! Kind of. This is research by Junki Yoshida et al. in Communications Biology, and we will link once again to a press release in phys.org uh, credited to Bob Yurka. Hey! For one of these, I also almost picked an article out of the interesting whatever the one you just <laughs> yes, said is yes yes that would have been a very uh homogenous uh, news list we would have to convince people we're not getting paychecks from them. <laughs> <laughs> yes we are not affiliated with this uh, website this research looks at a preserved larynx Ooh. in a dinosaur the larynx is a structure found in the throats of tetrapods that is us uh, mammals birds reptiles amphibians the larynx there's a lot of complexity to the larynx, but the basic thing is that the larynx uh, here in your throat controls airflow. Mm -hmm. And in many animals, uh, it also holds the vocal cords. Uh, the larynx is how we make noises. Yeah, this is when you hear people refer to the voice box. Yes, that is part of the larynx. Mm -hmm. In terms of functioning, the larynx is helpful in sound production. It also is helpful in controlling respiration mm -hmm. because it's controlling airflow in and out of the lungs. And the larynx uh, does function uh, in part to protect the airway, uh, to stop stuff <laughs> from, you know, going the wrong direction. Oh, yeah. So it's doing also anything that's moving in and out of this tube, whether it should be or shouldn't be, the larynx is involved somehow. Ah, this is you know, central command. But uh, fossil larynx, larynges, larynx <laughs> I, uh, are not uh, very well known, uh, especially in reptiles, especially in dinosaurs. This research describes a fossilized larynx in Pinacosaurus. Uh, Pinacosaurus is an ankylosaur, so Ooh. one of the armored dinosaurs, episode 69. This one comes from Mongolia. That's another uh, from Mongolia, from the Cretaceous, with preserved multiple uh, aspects of the larynx. This is exciting, number one, because, like I said, it's rare in the fossil record. La the larynx tends to be mostly cartilaginous, mm -hmm. uh, which means that it doesn't often fossilize. And this is the oldest known fossilized larynx. <laughs> According to the paper, the previous oldest one was an Eocene bird, Presbyornis. So this is tens of millions of years older than that, which is pretty cool. 
they were able to examine the shape and uh, bits of this larynx and found overall a similar structure to modern day reptiles with a few notable differences. Certain bony components of the uh, elements that are called the arytenoid and the circoid. I don't know what those are, but those are their names. <laughs> Certain aspects of those components of the larynx are larger than we often see in modern reptiles, and they have a distinct joint between them that would have given the larynx a little bit of extra mobility. Okay. So there's yeah. this increase in size, which probably correlates to increase in muscle attachments, and they've got this jointing. This structure, the authors point out, would most likely allow more control over airflow, more complex control. And in fact, certain of these features are also seen, at least similar features, in the more vocal living reptiles. And that jointedness to it is seen, according to them, only in birds. Interesting. So this is a larynx that seems to share a bunch of features with noisy reptiles and birds today. They describe that the way the larynx works in crocs, for example, in modern day crocs, the larynx produces sound, mm -hmm. uh, which I believe is also what our larynx is yes. doing it, very similarly. In birds, they have a different structure called the syrinx, and that produces sound while the larynx helps to moderate that sound, yes. which is part of why birds are able to make such a diversity of different vocalizations. Yeah, well, without lips and stuff, that they can just yes. go through an entire human sentence because it's all happening in that syrinx. <laughs> yes, so they have a very complex sound-producing system. The structure that they describe in this Pinnacosaurus larynx is similar enough that they suggest this might mean that these dinosaurs were able to produce sounds in a manner similar to birds, where the sound might have been being produced by a different structure. Yeah. Something, if not a syrinx, maybe something like that. And then the larynx was helping to moderate that sound. In the article, they say, and I quoted this, they say this larynx could potentially be associated with loud and explosive calls, as in vocal reptiles and birds. <laughs> so this is really cool. Number one, fossilized larynx. Very rare, very cool. Number two, potentially the implication that these might have been noisy dinosaurs, and dinosaurs making complex noises with their throat, mm -hmm. right? As opposed to, we've talked about hadrosaurs with like their big crests on their heads. This would be throat produced noises that yep. are, are being moderated and amplified in the throat the, the the prehistoric the who and also given all that this could be an indication that bird like vocalizations aren't restricted to birds among dinosaurs yeah that they may have shown up either in other groups or way earlier in dinosaur evolutionary history and birds happened to inherit that feature like so many other things that we keep discovering about yes. birds that actually that's a dinosaur thing and they just inherited it yes. and then became famous for it. They, they just also have it. <laughs> uh, and what's super cool about this is that in addition to all that stuff, this is an ankylosaur, yeah. which is very cool. I, I love the thought. Now, it's very difficult to say that this was definitely, you know, making all sorts of noises. But at least that it maybe it could have had complex vocalizations. I love the thought of a noisy ankylosaur. Oh, yeah. That is a very cool, cool image. Well, and I know that a previous news that I think came shortly after the bioacoustics episode. Mm, that was episode 52. Because I think I remember having a moment because uh, I did the news. But it was about uh, the nasal cavity of ankylosaurs. Yes. Because they have really big schnozzes. Yep. And the question of, okay, but why? And one of the potential answers was a resonating chamber, mm -hmm. that it might have been amplifying the noise that they uh, sent out. And so if this also is a potential support, like, they very well could, you could have these just armored foghorns. Yeah, bugles. Yeah, just, just. <laughs> well, they were tanks that could issue their own military charge. Yes, exactly. <laughs> now, I, now I'm uh, picturing uh, uh, Colonel Hat Hatley's march. Yes, <laughs> yes <jungle>. absolutely. <laughs> this just continues to add support to my personal headcanon that dinosaurs were doing silly songs oh, yeah. and silly dances. 
all the time. Well, it's like the if you ever see a video of like a rhino, like a zookeeper, and it comes up, and then they'll make like their weird rhino noises that aren't at all what you would expect. Like mm-hmm. they have these like like squeaks and like little tiny noises for such yeah. a big animal. You could have had ankylosaurs doing that, but like, yeah. <laughs> making making little chirps and, like, and little little uh, 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 honks. Yeah, I want a honking. Yes. that's, what, that's yes, really please. what I want. I would like it on my desk by Monday. <laughs> <laughs> honking ankylosaur. Well, this has been a fun uh, uh, detour up into the Mesozoic era, but that is the end of the news, which means that we are going to uh, take it a little bit closer to home uh, and spend the rest of the episode in the Eocene talking about this episode's main topic, the Messel Pit. We're going to start off, uh, for those of you unfamiliar, by just talking about what the Messel Pit is, why it's famous, and then get into some of the history. Stay tuned after the break. We've done a number of episodes about specific fossil localities. So we did a great fossil site, we've done Burgess Shale, we've done the Hell Creek Formation, we did the La Brea Tar Pits, we did the Naracourt Caves, and we tend to do famous, very well-known, very well-studied fossil sites, which means, especially nowadays that we've done the podcast for several years, that we're doing an entire episode about a site we've already talked about a bunch yeah. on the podcast. The Messel Pit has come up numerous times in the discussion we're about to have there will be several times where i will say we have already talked about this on the podcast yeah this is for also from the missile pit so this is going to be a fun one but as i said at the top of the episode this is the first fossil locality that we have zoomed in on in europe and it's also the first one uh from the early cenozoic the missile pit is an eocene fossil locality in germany the missile pit which is called gruba Messel. Ooh. I think in German. I don't speak German, so that's not... Uh, I, I only got up to F, and I never learned how to say that word. Uh, the Messel Pit, very famous for preserving lots of fossils, but also exceptionally well-preserved fossils. This is similar in that regard to the Jehol Biota, which we talked about in episode 152, the Burgess Shale, which was episode 89. Fossils from the Messel Pit tend to come as articulated specimens, like the full body with soft tissues and all sorts of stuff. Some of the best fossils ever discovered in the world come from the Messel Pit, and I have seen it referred to as the single best fossil site from the Paleogene, which is the first half-ish of the Cenozoic era. And because we're in the Paleogene, this is a site where we're finding lots of fossils of early mammals, uh, early Mammals in their time to shine, early members of familiar groups of mammals, birds, things like that. This is post-age of the dinosaurs, but way before a lot of our very familiar stuff today. Yes. We will get into more details on the specific finds of the Messel Pit in a bit. But first, let's go into some more details about the site itself. The Messel Pit is located in the German land of Hesse, about 35 kilometers south of Frankfurt, for those of you who know German geography. The Messel Pit is a large pit. It is just a large pit dug into the earth uh, with a diameter. I've seen a couple different numbers, but a d- diameter of about 700 meters dug into an outcrop of what I have seen described as bituminous, finely laminated black pellite, mm. which is also commonly call- called oil shale. Oh, there we go. It is layer upon layer, very fine layers of shale with organic remains compressed between them to produce Oil. It is a very rich in organic material. The oil shale of Messel uh, covers almost two square kilometers. The bedding itself goes down almost 200 meters. This is a large, wide deposit of this oil shale. It was first noted in the 18th century, and as you might imagine, it became a very attractive site, not for fossils, but because it's full of oil. Yeah. Uh, This became a mining attraction. People would mine it extract the oil shale to use it to produce mineral oil and paraffin. And one source that I said uh, mentioned that later on it was used to produce electricity. Okay, yeah, yeah. So this has been a very important fossil fuel resource uh, in this site for a long time. It was noted early on that the Messel Pit is also full of fossils. 
I have seen it mentioned in a number of places that the first significant find, the first find that apparently made people really take uh, notice, was the find of an alligator fossil. Hey! Uh, a diplocynodon discovered in 1875. Some of the best fossil sites are found that way. You know, I... <laughs> <laughs> there are a surprising number of similarities between the Messel Pit and the Gray Fossil Site, uh, including that both of them, one of the most important early discoveries was alligator. Yeah, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make comparisons a lot. <laughs> I was surprised as I went through this. See, this is how you know a fossil site's gonna be good. Is if you starts off it, starts oh. off with something cool. Yeah, just you wait. There's even cooler stuff. <laughs> I doubt it. Into the 1900s. Uh, many other fossils were collected and described, uh, became housed in museums, but mining continued. Mining continued at the Messel Pit for a, a century or so. This was a very lucrative mining area. Eventually, scientists would develop specific preparation techniques that allowed long-term storage of the fossils. Uh, this has been noted in a number of histories I read that there are special techniques that they've used to preserve the fossils, which allowed them to be used for more and more research. Cool. Finally, in the 1960s, mining operations were discontinued, and for a while, it was unclear what was going to become of this site. Apparently, there was a not insignificant plan, or at least suggestion of a plan, to turn it into a place for refuse, to oh. make it a dump. Uh, which not everybody was happy about. Yeah, no. Uh, it almost it almost became a garbage dump. <laughs> that, Ultimately, that gives me heartburn. <laughs> doesn't that? No, it's just uh, just you wait. Ultimately, the German government declared the site a cultural monument. There we go. It was protected. It was preserved because of the fossils that they said. Let let us let's protect this site. And in 1995, the Messel Pit became the first German national monument to become a UNESCO World Heritage site cool uh this is not the first unesco world heritage site we've talked about on the podcast burgess shale is one i think nara court caves is one oh, i'm, yeah, I'm yeah, blanking yeah. on whether or not that specifically is true i could be misremembering um unesco is the united nations educational scientific and cultural organization unesco world heritage sites are sites that are deemed to have outstanding universal value uh, for all sorts of important stuff all around the world including a number of fossil sites Nowadays, the Messel Pit is operated by the Senckenberg Society for Nature Research, who are in charge of maintaining the site, protecting the site, and sustaining scientific research. The site has been altered significantly. One source that I read said that over a century of mining, approximately 20 million tons of rock were removed from the site, which is a ton, that's so much rock, probably full of fossil material. Fortunately, <sighs> the Messel deposit is enormous. So there are tons, there's tons, tons more uh, to be discovered. So far, tens of thousands of fossils have been recovered from Messel. And according to the sources that I read, over a thousand species of plants and animals have been identified among the fossil remains of the Messel pit. That is the modern history of the Messel pit. Now let's go back and talk about the deep history of the Messel pit. How the site formed, what it actually was back in the day. The Messel Pit preserves an ecosystem from the Middle Eocene. So that is, it is between 47 and 48 million years ago. The Eocene, for a refresher, is in the early Cenozoic. General features of the Eocene, uh, the thing that is one of the most famous things about the Eocene is that, at least in the early to Middle Eocene, it was very warm. Yeah. Very warm climate. The Eocene starts with the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum from episode 103. This is a time where we have the warmest temperatures around the world of the Cenozoic era. Later on in the Eocene, things start to cool as we move into the Oligocene. At the time of the Messel Pit, this was a very warm uh, planet. Tectonically, the world was a very interesting place because it was almost where we are today. Right, right. Almost continents like they are today. During the Eocene, some really important stuff happens. Antarctica splits from Australia oh, and yeah. becomes isolated, which we talked about in episode 11, that that would eventually allow Antarctica to become the frozen land it is today. Laurasia is breaking up, which means Europe, Greenland, and North America are coming apart, while Eurasia, as we know it today, is coming together. Europe, Asia, and India come together over the course of the Eocene. 
In terms of living things, the Eocene was a world full of lots of forests. There are subtropical and tropical forests known across North America and Europe, because this was a very warm world, and polar forests. We had forested ecosystems way up in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And, of course, the Eocene is when most of our modern important groups of, of mammals, especially, are getting their start. The Eocene is when we see the origins, the, familiar, the recognizable origins of hoofed animals, primates, elephants, rodents, carnivorous mammals, and so on, as they gradually sort of come up and replace the early Cenozoic groups of mammals. So we are about 15 million years after the end of the Cretaceous, well on our way into the age of mammals as we know it. Within that world, the Messel Pit itself, located similar to its position uh, where it is today, you know, in that roughly European area, was a lake. In fact, it was a mar lake. Hmm. Now, do you know what a mar is? I know I've heard that before, but I don't actually know what specifies it. A mar is a hole in the ground created by volcanic activity. Okay. But specifically by a phreatomagmatic eruption. Now, magmatic means magma. Mm -hmm. uh, phreato refers to steam. Okay. A phreatomagmatic eruption happens when magma meets groundwater. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not it's not a steam eruption exclusively. That's a free a, a phreatic eruption, if I remember correctly. It is phreatomagmatic. It is a volcanic eruption, but it's also an explosion of groundwater. Yeah. But like all sorts of volcanic activity, it leaves a big hole in the ground. In this case, it became a lake. Cool. So this mar became a lake. Add that to the list of ways that the Messel Pit is kind of similar to the Gray Fossil Site. At Gray, it was a sinkhole that became a lake and then gradually filled up with sediment. The Messel Pit was a mar lake filled up with water and gradually collected sediment and fossils over the years that, that became the famous oil shale of Messel today. The geology of the Messel Pit is, as I mentioned before, almost 200 meters down from the surface of oil shale, and underneath that, hundreds more meters of pyroclastic deposits. Oh, cool. Of all the broken up rock from the volcanic eruption. Nice. Well, it's, it's how, we, like, the bowl that the gray fossil site is in is the limestone cave that collapsed. Mm -hmm. uh, that's cool. That's yep. neat. So there, they, they, I read a study that went down, that drilled down through it, and you see all the lake sediments, and then underneath them is the chaos <laughs> that was caused by the initial eruption. Cool. The lake is estimated to have been well over a kilometer wide at least, uh, and up to hundreds of meters deep when it was active. The deposit is estimated to cover about a million years from top to bottom. Oh, wow. So when I said the age of the site is 48 to 47 million years old, I don't mean somewhere within that. Like, it, it is estimated to start around yep. 48 and go to around 47. That's pretty awesome. Uh, so it covers a pretty substantial selection of time uh, during the Eocene. The plant remains indicate a dense, near-tropical rainforest surrounding the lake. Again, very much like Gray. Dense forest surrounding a lake. Except that in this case, uh, it was far more of a tropical environment than it would have been during the early Pliocene, because this is the Eocene in Europe. Yes. There is evidence for not only the forest surrounding the lake, but also that the lake had seasonal blooms of algae. This was a very warm, wet place. There have actually been uh, some studies that have determined climate estimates, using plants, using things like leaf margin analysis, to estimate a mean annual temperature of around 22 degrees Celsius, with the coldest month well above 10 degrees Celsius. I found a, a source estimating annual precipitation of 2,500 millimeters and average humidity as high as 77%. This was, as one source put it, warm, humid, and frost-free. <laughs> this is a good vacation propaganda. <laughs> yes. This is a great play. This was, oh, and that's all very important information because high temperatures, high precipitation, high humidity and especially no frost. Uh, that's something that has come up with discussions at Gray a bunch, is we had alligators and we went, okay, that tells us something about the coldest time of the year yes. in this ancient ecosystem. In the Eocene, this was not even a question. Yeah. This was very warm. 
there has been research over the years uh, and that sounds like there has there have been some back and forths about what the evidence says about the structure of the lake. Okay. But the more recent evidence coming from uh, the geochemistry of the sediment suggests that the lake was probably pretty well stratified, meaning there wasn't a lot of mixing from the top and uh, with the top and the bottom layers allowing for oxygen poor deeper waters of the lake bingo which is one of the best ways to get a fossil site that is full of wonderfully preserved specimens because things sink down to the bottom and then they are relatively untouched because poor oxygenated waters are toxic for scavengers and decomposers yes yet another uh, 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 similarity yep <laughs> same thing with gray so the messel ecosystem was a large lake in a forest characterized by probably deep waters, probably anoxic waters, and gradual deposition of sediment coming in from the surrounding environment in a habitat that would have been home to all sorts of organisms because it was warm and wet and it didn't get very cold and there were tons of plants and there was a lake to live in. This was a very... It it had that same combination we talked about with Gray, where it was a great place for plants and animals to be and then it was a great place for fossils to form yeah a good good place to live and die yes absolutely great place for us you know, <laughs> here 50 million years later and on top of all that the messel pit preserves these wonderful layers covering this wide stretch of time which has allowed a bunch of studies on how this ecosystem changed over the course of its history a lot of that comes down to plants plant fossils at messel include Leaves, fruits, seeds, flowers, wood, and pollen, a lot of which are extraordinarily well-preserved because that's what Messel does. You get these specimens that are pressed between the layers of the shale, and you just get a whole leaf imprint or a whole body of an animal, something like that. One of the coolest things that I found that researchers have been able to accomplish with that gradual accumulation of sediments and the abundant plant remains is not just reconstruct how the environment changed over the course of the life of that lake, but specifically, I read a study that was using pollen to examine how the lake was recolonized after the volcanic explosion. Cool. Because there was an eruption. This this hole this hole in the ground started when the ground exploded. Yes. That's what a phreatomagmatic explosion uh, eruption is, which would have devastated the surrounding forest. Right, there was a forest there already. This would have absolutely devastated it. So the Messel Pit has been a site where researchers have been able to study how plants moved back into the area. So this study uh, looked at pollen records down in the lower level layers of the deposit and found that shortly after the eruption, shortly after the formation, when you've got all those chunks of broken up. Uh, rock and stuff, the pollen reveals a flora of relatively low diversity, not a lot of plants. Particularly, there were lots of ferns and woody swamp plants, the kind of things that colonize first. And then as time goes on, they saw more and more diversity in this tropical forest that as, as the forest sort of built back in this region. Very, like, all of that's expected. But very cool that we can detect it. Very cool to be able to reconstruct that at a fossil site. Mm-hmm. The other thing they noted is that as the plants sort of got settled again in the area, that would have stabilized the slopes around the lake. It would have held the soil in place so there right, would have right. been less weathering. And as the plants increase in diversity, they see evidence of less sediment flowing into the lake, which they also pointed out that decrease of sediment flow into the lake would have helped the lake become stratified. Yep, yep, yep. That that would have helped reduce the mixing of the upper and lower layers, eventually leading to, oh, they had a term for it that I didn't write down, a specific term that means that it wasn't mixing top and and lower layers of the the lake, which is why the Messel Pit became such a wonderful fossil site in the first place. So they are not only reconstructing the recolonization of the area after the eruption, but the gradual development of the lake as the type of habitat that would eventually give rise to this great fossil site. 
Yeah. Very cool. It also would extend the life of the lake because it's not going to mm-hmm. fill up as quickly if you're slowing down sedimentation. Like for sure. Very cool. It's it the the going through the step by step of from its formation is a very neat way to look at it uh, and very much has that that cascading that this happened as things recovered, which then affected the lake this way. Yeah, that's awesome. This is the kind of formational detail that we don't yet have for the gray fossil site. Yes. As it's only, we've only been doing it for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, The paper that did all this study referred to this as a textbook example of recolonization of volcanically disturbed areas. Very cool. And fossils. Further study on plants noted other shifts over the history of the lake, uh, notably climate shifts often correlating with orbital cycles. Oh, yeah. So they're able to detect the influence of, like, the Milankovitch cycles, changes in the way that the Earth moves in relation to the sun over the history of the Messel Lake. So we can see all these different changes over time in which plants were particularly dominant, in which climate shifts are occurring. The plants provide a very detailed look at the history of this habitat. Very cool. The full plant component, while we're talking about plants, uh, is quite extensive. I will list some of the things. Uh, The full flora includes lots of green algae, multiple different types of algae, ferns, conifers, apparently including at least things like pine and yew. Uh, This is known from macro fossils, but also pollen. And then tons of others, uh, tons of angiosperms, things like water lilies, palms, grasses, mangoes, grapes, winter hazel. These are all plants that I saw listed and wrote down. There were tons more, (laughs) uh, hundreds of species of plants. The forest surrounding Messel appears uh, to have featured most prominently plants of the legumes and walnut families. Okay. And as will become a theme as we go on through the rest of the episode, there are some exceptional finds among the plants. I will mention one for the purposes of our discussion here. There was a 2011 study. So yeah, you remember in the news when I talked about this really cool study about plants that was an interpretation based on damage on the leaves from insects? Yeah. This is similar. This was a 2011 study that examined fossil leaves from the mesel pit that had an unusual pattern of damage where they had a pair, in multiple places, they would have a pair of puncture marks on either side of the leaf veins. So the major vein in the leaf, there'd be little punctures on either side of the leaf. And as it turns out, the authors noted there is a specific circumstance wherein leaves will get that particular kind of damage. They found that the pattern they saw in the fossil leaves was a very good match for damage we see in modern leaves caused by ants who are infected with cordyceps fungus. Yes. Because they crawl up onto the leaf and then latch on and sit there and wait to get eaten. Yes, I remember, I think this did this come up in the... No, this, I, 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 I remember this from Parasites. Uh, ah. Yes. Because I, I, you started talking about, like, I remember these leaf marks. Why do I remember these leaf marks? Yep. Yep. Episode 102. Because, as we mentioned, we've talked about <laughs> Messel a whole bunch of times. Uh, the cordyceps fungus, go ahead. Is a fungus that... When the spores get onto ants, they then develop inside the ant's body and take over their brain and nervous system, driving them to go off into higher up places where then the actual fruiting mushroom bursts from the back or head of the ant. Yes. I didn't just erroneously say that they go out there to get eaten. I was thinking about a different parasite. No, the cordyceps fungus does it to get a high vantage point for the spores to spread. Yep, yep. Uh, and it causes the ant to ma- to to perform what the paper described as the death grip. Yes. Because that's where the ant dies. Yeah. It latches on, and then that's that's where it is. So here at the Messel Pit, we have damage on leaves that provides indirect evidence of some of the oldest... I think, I think it's the oldest record of this behavior in ants mm-hmm. infected by the fungus, which is extremely cool so awesome uh for a technical note uh, the fungus is ophiocordyceps suffice it to say the plants of mesel have given rise to tons of really fascinating research both about highly specific things in the ecosystem and also about 
incredible trends over time. But, of course, here at the Common Descent Podcast, uh, we have a bias <laughs> in the fossils that we like to talk about. So we are done talking about plants, and we will spend the rest of this episode talking about the animal fossils of the Messel Pit, including broad patterns and also some of the just extraordinary famous finds of Messel. Stay tuned after the break for that. As I mentioned earlier, fossils from the Messel Pit are often found exceptionally well-preserved. When it comes to animals, this often means complete specimens, whole bodies with vertebrates, whole skeletons, pressed nicely within the layers. It is very common that animal fossils at Messel preserve soft tissues, uh, including things like fur and feathers, but also like organs and stuff. It is everything that you could possibly want. Let's go. We're going to go through the animal components of the Messel ecosystem, and along the way, I will make it a point to note some exceptional examples of the kinds of things that Messel has offered. Uh, let's start off very quickly with invertebrates. There's tons of invertebrates at Messel. There are apparently freshwater sponges. Oh, neat. That's pretty cool. I have no further information about that. Yeah. Uh, but apparently they're there. Cool. There are crustaceans. There are spiders. I came across one study that described a spider from Messel, and it showed the fossil, and it's just a spider. Yep, yep. It's just a spider smushed into the sediment, which is ridiculous because that is not how we find spiders. Nope. Very often. Also, in addition to spiders, harvest men. Yay. So daddy long legs uh, type things. So you got both. And unsurprisingly, uh, there are tons of insects. Tons of insect remains. Again, often as body fossils. Yes. They're not preserved in amber. They're not little bits and pieces. They are a whole insect smushed into the sediment. These include beetles, flies, ants, bees, wasps, damselflies, leaf insects, and a bunch of others. <laughs> and the rest of them. And all of the, all the other insects. I found one 2012 study, just to name an example, that in that one study identified 22 new species <laughs> Of ants. Wow. From Messel. Just ants. <laughs> That's <laughs> this is awesome. A very rich fossil site. Uh, there was also a study that came out last year, 2022, that looked at a shrimp from Messel, a freshwater shrimp, with guts preserved. Oh, like yeah. Gut tissues. So even among invertebrates, there's an ex a wonderful diversity and really, really well preserved fossils. That's that's so incredible. It, it, and we've we've discussed this multiple times when talking about insect and arthropod fossils that very often sediment is not kind to them. Yes, amber and stuff is how we get a lot of those. So the fact that they're doing extremely well fossil wise here is big deal. Yep, this is a place where Messel uh, departs heavily from the gray fossil site. Yes. Uh, we don't often get that at mm. the gray fossil site. No. And then, of course, there's uh, insect damage on leaves that apparently tells us sometimes about zombie ants. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to vertebrates, uh, which are the most famous things from Messel, as is the case with many fossil yep. sites. There are plenty of fish. Again, I've seen images of fish from Messel that is just a whole fish. Yep. Just right there in the sediment. Similar to, like, the Green River Formation here in the U.S., which is also Eocene. There are salamanders, specifically newts, if I understood what I was reading correctly. Oh. Frogs and toads. Many kinds of reptiles, including several types of lizards and turtles. Apparently, according to one source that I read, the most common vertebrate fossils at the Messel site are birds. Huh. Which is very strange. Yeah. Because birds, as we've discussed before, tend not to be common at fossil sites. They, they tend to be small and they tend to be relatively delicate, so they don't often survive pres uh, fossilization very well. Now we've got some, some J-hole seasoning. <laughs> yes. Now it's a, well, yeah, the, the, I was going to say the really well-preserved invertebrates is Shades of the Burgess Shale yep, yep. <laughs> and Maison Creek. And we've got very well-preserved birds, which feels a bit like Jahol uh, over in China. Um, the source that I read said that there have been thousands of bird fossils discovered, including around 70 different species. Wow. Often known from complete skeletons, often with feathers and even sometimes gut contents 
inside the birds. Absolutely ridiculous. That's no joke. These include lots of familiar groups, uh, like early swifts, wading birds, owls, ibises, just to throw out a few of the words that I recognized <laughs> when I was reading them. <laughs> One of the most common birds at the Messel Pit is Messalornis, which is a relative of modern rails. That is a trend. There are lots of animals named after Messel. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> also, another bird found at the Messel Pit is Gastornis. Oh, hey. The big flightless bird from the early Cenozoic, the yeah. Gastorniths, uh, are b- basically the moas of the early Cenozoic. Formerly interpreted as large predatory birds, but more recently reinterpreted as probably plant eaters. Nifty. Uh, Gastornis was the bird that was hunting tiny horses in Walking with Prehistoric Beasts. Oh, yeah, it was. Mm-hmm. All right, cool, cool, cool. Uh, which they probably did not do. Yeah. Because they were probably eating seeds and stuff. <laughs> but it was a cool, it was a cool scene. Oh, that, that horse tried to take its seeds. That horse, it, was, it had it coming. <laughs> and on a similar note, at a fossil site from the Cenozoic, where there are exceptionally abundant fossil remains of birds, can you guess what other group is exceptionally well represented at Messel that makes it super weird? I'm not sure. If this were like the Jehulbiota, if this were a Mesozoic site, the answer I'd be looking for would probably be pterosaurs. Right, right. But it is not. At Messel, oh. some of the most common fossils at Messel are bats. Oh, that's awesome. I found a 2013 study that said over 700 individual bats have been identified at Messel, typically from complete skeletons. Wow. Which is even more preposterous than the birds. Wow. Yeah, that's insane. We did an episode, episode 59, all about bats, and we talked about how the bat fossil record is really bad. It's really, really not good. Bats are not nearly as common as birds, and they have all the other same issues that birds do. They just don't fossilize very well. Most of the time where we find bats, we find bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. Little teeth and jaws and stuff, like at Gray. At Messel, they get complete skeletons, some with uh, preserved patagia, so the wing membranes, auditory anatomy. So there have been studies that have looked at the hearing, like studying the style of echolocation that these bats might have had. Oh, cool. There are bats with stomach contents. One of the studies, I think that the 2013 study, described that there are so many different bats and bat fossils that researchers have been able to interpret different different ecological niches for the different bats. Yeah. That some were big flying over the canopy, some were flying under the canopy. We have those whole bat ecosystem interpreted from this site, which is something that is almost unheard of in the fossil record. That's amazing. Wow. Super cool. When I started reading about that, I was like, oh, is this, is this one of those sites where we've gotten one of those like super rare, cool early bats that give us like our almost non-existent glimpses into the origins of bats uh, and no apparently not yeah yeah <laughs> the bat i was thinking of came from wyoming uh, <laughs> i did not see any note of like a cool transitional bat from messel uh it's possible i missed it but also even it even even in the circumstances <laughs> uh bats are extremely cagey yes. about their evolutionary history still that's that's pretty impressive it is very cool uh, and the fossils themselves are awesome. Yeah. Because it picture up the bat or ter- or the bird or pterosaur type fossils we get where they're just smushed into the dirt. It's that with bats. And it's so cool. Very gothic. It is very, <laughs> yes, absolutely. And it's in uh, Europe. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> of course, there are other mammals. In fact, uh, a lot of the most famous fossil finds from Messel are mammals. Because this is the early Cenozoic, this, we, this is a time period that we have the rise of the age of mammals in full swing, as I mentioned earlier, we have early members of a lot of familiar groups. So Messel includes uh, early artiodactyls, so including the kinds of things we talked about in the last episode. There are early horses, early tapers, plenty of rodents, and some early carnivorans, so the carnivorous mammals, including one that I think is called Messelogale, nah. another Messel, alongside other older groups like creodonts. There are creodonts at Messel, uh, which is a group that did not event, did not last till today, mm-hmm. that went extinct not long after, as things like carnivorans took over. There are a handful of really standout mammal fossils, at least standout uh, in my opinion. Buxolestes, it was described online as a non-placental eutherian, so oh, okay. a close cousin of placental mammals, but not quite a placental mammal. 
that was semi-aquatic. So this Ooh. thing was living kind of like an otter or something similar. Also at Messel, Leptictidium. Hey! Which is a name that Will and I both recognize only because of Walking with Prehistoric Beasts. Yep, yep. <laughs> because it was the star of one of the episodes. Yes. <laughs> uh, Leptictidium, incidentally, uh, for those who are keeping track, is the fossil that is in the teaser image for this episode that we posted on social media. Uh, Leptictidium was were small hopping mammals. Yes. They look like tiny kangaroos. Uh, they are not a member of any modern group of mammals. They are an ancient group. Uh, and they were, just, you know, hopping around uh, kind of like a kangaroo or a kangaroo rat. Yeah, very cute in that episode. Very well. It had a little no, twitchy mobile nose. Yeah. yeah, they were pretty cute. Speaking of small, cute animals, let's. Uh, I'm going to try to elicit a similar response as the bats. There are apparently at least three different genera of pangolins. Whoa. Or near pangolins identified from the mesel pit. Oh, pangolins, dear listeners, are small-ish, you know, armadillo-sized, scaly mammals. So they're covered in these shingle-like scales. Google it. Pangolins are awesome. They're, they're one of the most visually pleasing mammals. Like, I love them. And they're also very unique. Mm-hmm. They're very distinctive. Nothing else has armor like a pangolin does. The pangolin fossils at Messel include Eomanus which was touted at the time of its discovery as the oldest known pangolin. That's probably still true, although there may be others at Messel that vie with it. Uh, Eomanus was described as being very similar to modern pangolins. There is also Euromanus, which is also very pangolin, either a pangolin or something very close to pangolins, which is scaleless. Whoa. It is a naked paladin, or paladin, pangolin. (laughs) Uh, it doesn't have its scale mail yeah. armor on, yep. uh, which is where I'm sure my brain went with that. <laughs> Armorless. Armorless Ooh. pangolin. Weird. How weird is that? And it's like, that's one, this is one of those weird things where that's not actually weird. <laughs> no, because pangolins are weird. A scaleless mammal is pretty normal. <laughs> yes. Most mammals, in fact, almost every mammal that you can think of yeah, almost, today. Almost every mammal that's not a pangolin. <laughs> are scaleless, but I don't know. I can't even form a mental image of what a scaleless penguin looks. Yeah, the best that I come up with, what my, what my brain wants to fill that in is a, an armadillo without its armor, right. which is not helpful. Yes. Like, that is not any better. I guess maybe... I, like an aardvark, yeah, maybe? Yeah, were they... I guess... I mean, I assume it was furry. <laughs> like, sure. Well, right. Was. Like... Uh, yeah. But yeah, I just or, picturing like a tree uh, anteater, like yes, long, and, long ta- prehensile tail. And indeed, there is another one, I believe, at Messel that was either identified as an anteater, but actually might be closer to the pangolins. Mm-hmm, I think that's mm-hmm. what the story was. Uh, so yeah, they may have looked a lot like anteaters. Apparently, there were plenty of ants. Yeah. So they would have they would have done fine. Oh, weird. So multiple types of pangolins. So weird. That's weird because there aren't multiple types of pangolins today. Yeah, yeah. We we do not have a, a wide variety. <laughs> there is there is a pangolin and diminishing at that. Yep, yep. Uh, speaking of uh, interesting creatures that are, I guess, kind of in that same line, uh, there are early primates oh. at Messel, uh, the most famous of which is a primate named Darwinius. Oh, hey, Darwinius. Yep, this is a famous one. Again, known from a really exceptional fossils of just this curled up little primate thing. Member of the Adapiforms, known from a single skeleton with soft tissue, with the fur outlined with plants in its guts, the classic Messel stuff. Darwinius is known from a single specimen uh, named Ida. Ida's got a whole story. The story of the Darwinius specimen is one that it was, if I remember the story correctly, it the slab and counter slab so split between two layers one side has the fossil one side has the impression and maybe some other parts of the fossil were separated and sold right they right, were yes. sold separately and then later scientists managed to get them back together to describe the fossil uh in 2009 it was described as the most complete known fossil primate wow very cool stuff from the time period where primates were in their earliest stages that's exciting. So there is a wide diversity of animals found at Messel. There is a wide variety of exceptionally well-preserved 
fossil specimens with very complete skeletons. This, and also really exceptional details on the fossils. For example, I've already mentioned a couple of examples of these, but there are tons of examples of gut contents at Messel. Yeah. There are, to name a few, I pulled these out of one of the studies uh, that I read, there are lizard fossils with both plant and insect remains inside. There are bats with insects in their guts, birds with pollen inside, horses with leaves and grapes preserved within. There are also coprolites, uh, including fish poop that has arthropod, probably crustacean or insect bits in it, and at least one mammal coprolite that I read of that had a fragment of a primate jaw (laughs) inside of it. (laughs) This is a mammal that bit the head off of a primate. Yep. All of these different gut contents examples plus stable isotopes of fossils, have allowed researchers to reconstruct the food web of Messel. I read one study that was looking at carbon and nitrogen isotopes in the different fossil animals because the nature of the carbon and nitrogen isotopes will differ depending on where in the food web an organism is. If they're the producer, if they're a primary consumer or a secondary consumer, which has allowed researchers to reconstruct the food web and the relationships between the different organisms and have found that it was very similar to modern ponds. Yeah. Where you've got plants and algae at the base with various crustaceans and insects and fish and larger fish with bigger vertebrate animals, uh, tetrapod animals at the top of that lake food chain feeding on all the other stuff. Once again, not unexpected, but very cool that we can actually map that out. Yes. Uh, And again, shades of the Jehol biota, Mm -hmm. where we've got food web reconstruction for an ancient ecosystem. Neat. On a similar note to gut contents, which is a type of exceptional detail preserved in fossils, there have also been a number of studies looking at organic molecules Ah. preserved in mesal fossils, including evidence of coloration. There are studies that have identified melanosomes, which are the pigment-containing cells. There was one study from 2009 that examined a bird feather and found an arrangement of melanosomes that matched modern-day iridescent birds. Right, right, right. The structural coloration in the feather. There was a 2016 study that found uh, blood vessel-like microstructures inside the bones, so the places where blood vessels may once have been. There was a 2022 study that I found that looked at a fish fossil and found uh, identified remnants of proteins called porphyrins, which were probably left over from the degraded remains of hemoglobin. Wow. These are blood proteins identified within this fish. And then a really cool one, uh, there was a 2017 study that was looking at bird fossils. So the bird fossils tend to preserve really detailed structures and apparently some of the birds preserve an internal organ sort of sort of the the compression remnant of an internal organ that has been suspected to be the uropigial gland which is a gland in birds uh, which i think is near the tail that produces oils Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that birds use when preening their feathers yes this 2017 study identified lipid molecules preserved where that gland was preserved. Ha! Which is what you'd expect to see in a thing that's producing oils. So there's also been a bunch of cool organic molecule studies from Messel, which is not surprising given how wonderful the preservation is. Cool! That, yeah. No, it's just, it's just fun observations after fun observations. Very awesome. And speaking of things inside the cool fossil animals, there are... A number of fossil animals preserved at Messel with embryos inside. Yep, yep, yep. One article that I read said that there have been eight specimens of pregnant horses. Ha! Eight! That's, that's so many. Each with one embryo inside. Aww. uh, Which I think is what horses do today. Yes. They give birth to one, uh, young. Yeah, they don't, they don't have litters. They certainly don't. And speaking of reproduction... Now I'm going to talk about another one that we've talked about before on this podcast. I don't remember where this came up, but I am quite certain that we talked about this. One of the most famous findings from the Messel Pit, one of the things that has made headlines most consistently, is a study uh, examining reproductive habits in turtles. Mm. There are several types of turtles preserved at the Messel Pit. 
the most famous of which is a turtle called Aleochiles, which are cousins of modern-day Coretochiles, which is the pig-snouted turtle. So already a uh, big fan of this turtle. Yep, yep, on the right track. There was a 2012 study that identified nine pairs of turtles preserved at the Messel Pit in twos. Aww. They examined the turtles and identified that in each of the pairs, one of them was larger, with a shorter tail and a more flexible plaster on the belly part of the shell, while the other one was not those things, which matches what we see in turtles today between male and female. Yeah. So these appear to have been nine male and female pairs of turtles, and seven of them, the turtles are in direct contact hmm. at the back of the shell. Ha. They are touching along the back of the shell. This has been interpreted as mating pairs of turtles. Yep, yep, uh, yep. The headlines for the and I think actually the title of the paper is Caught in the Act. <laughs> that these are pairs of male-female turtles that seem to have become fossilized while mating with each other. Oh, that's so cool. It is a very unusual... The, the, the paper noted that this is, as of 2012, the only known vertebrate fossils preserved in the act of mating. Yes. Uh, although we did have that one study we had talked about about those fish. Yes. Uh, which I think was after this. So as of 2012, this paper declared <laughs> this was the only known fossil of vertebrates in the act of mating. Very cool. I wonder if it, it uh, I can picture a situation of them mounting or, or, or connecting to mate and then accidentally sinking down. I'm so glad you mentioned yeah. that because that is exactly how they interpreted it in yeah. the paper. Because they actually, I, I mentioned earlier that there has been some debate over time about the structure of the lake and why all these animals are preserved here. There had been earlier suggestions that it might have been toxic algal blooms. Yep, yep, yep. Or uh, gas clouds. Makes sense. That the lake might have uh, every now and then belched out a toxic cloud. Which, if I remember right, is what happens to the Leptictidium in that episode of Walking with Prehistoric Beasts. Oh, and it, it, I don't think it happens to Leptictidium, but it, it... Was that a different episode? Well, it was the same episode, but it happens to Amblycetus. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. That, that so it, that might not have been Messel. Uh, that they come up on it dead on the uh, shore because of toxicity and gotcha, like gotcha gotcha but they had they had the gas belches coming from right. uh that has been suggested for a number of different fossil sites mm -hmm. Messel being one of them as opposed to the other suggestion that it was just a stratified lake and that deeper down the water became unlivable this study of the turtles makes the point that this seems to support the idea of the different layers of the lake because if the water was toxic it's weird to imagine that the turtles were swimming, courting, and mating in the water before they died. Yes, exactly. But that, as you just described, it may be that they did all that in the safe upper waters, and then while mating began to sink and ended up in the toxic deep waters of the lake. Which then it would make sense that if, if they slowly drift into that without noticing, they now have, you know, they're in a worse spot. They're, they're, they're getting toxified mm -hmm. and may even if they have that moment of like oh no it may be too late like you're you're now you have gone down to the bottom yes you are now impaired by the effects of the water and you you're not going to be able to struggle your way back up right uh i also know that turtle mating can be lengthy yeah uh, i was gonna say i don't know if they're i don't know how intertwined the two would be because yeah. i know that they're lining up at the back of the body. I don't know if, like, the tails are intertwining or something. Well, it's because, like, with sea turtles, uh, the male will... Like, a lot of turtles in the male will mount onto the back of the female shell. That's why a lot of males have dips in their shell to fit onto the female shell. Mm -hmm. uh, and for anyone wondering, the female's typically the larger one. So if these turtles are Oh, yes, similar, I did not mention that. Yes. That, the females are interpreted as the larger ones. Yep. yep. Which is common in reptiles. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for that might be that that gives you more room to fit eggs. Yep. And I know with sea turtles, uh, the males have little hooks on their front flippers that they'll hold on to the female's front of the shell. Mm -hmm. But, like, they can be hooked up for, like, hours. Yeah. I don't know how common lengths are for different species, but I know, glop like, big tortoises also are yeah. lengthy events. My, my understanding is that reptiles in general, copulation can last a while. Yeah, that you lock, you, you, you dock, you hook up together, and then you are now... 
hooked up. You are you are bound, literally literally yes, hooking up. You are literally connected <laughs> until the mating finishes. So if it could be that these turtles were sort of stuck together. Well, it's, uh, I know that, that will happen with like wolves. That I I distinctly remember seeing a documentary as a kid where it was a lower in the pack male tried to sneak in mating with one of the females and got caught Mm -hmm. by the dominant and couldn't leave and couldn't leave because Because mating wasn't done yet yep and And that's not how their genitals work yes (laughs) so (laughs) the lower male was just desperately trying to run whilst not able to and was it was very distressful i could absolutely picture that with the turtles that even if they realize oh we, we are sinking into the bad part of the lake we can't swim effectively. We're we're awkward. Right. We're clumsy, and even if we start swimming back up, we we might not get back up in time to avoid the effects of the toxic water. So the paper uh, concluded that this is not only cool evidence of mating in these fossil animals, but consistent with the image of a lake that, as they put it, had quote inhabitable surface waters and a deadly abyss yes yes <laughs> well and it, it's because it's that it's that like carbon monoxide poisoning where it's just that if you drift into there every moment you are there is a moment that it's going to be harder to survive what's happening to you uh, which is part of what potentially made this fossil site such a good place for preserving these animal remains yes you can you can i i just that's that's so awesome that's such a vivid image now uh, I am almost done with my uh, discussion of the animal fossils at Messel, but astute listeners may have noticed that there are two particular groups of animals that I have neglected to mention up until this point, and that is because I am going to end this discussion with crocs and snakes. Woo! Because there are tons of both. <laughs> yeah. There are several different types of crocs that have been found at the Messel pit, there is Diplocynodon, which is the one I mentioned early on. The one that was, one of these was the first reported fossil from Messel. Diplocynodon is an alligatoroid, so not quite alligator lineage, but close to gators. I've read it described as probably similar to modern caimans yep. in terms of just body shape and lifestyle. Well, because that's what we call that group, the alligatoroids. But caimans are the most common. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, we only have two alli- like. Caimans really are the more defining group. <laughs> yes. Uh, Diplocynodon is known from a bunch of places, but they're particularly well-preserved at Messel. Known from complete skeletons, many apparently with gastroliths yeah. in the guts, which is very cool. I'm pretty sure this might be where I I knew the name of Messel Pit from, is mm. a lot of really pretty laid out crocs with like all the osteoderms yep. covered the back where in the order they would have been. From the Messel Pit. Yes. Uh, it's so cool. Uh, there's also Hasiakosuchus, which is a small gator, yeah. only known from Messel. Uh, I saw a, rep- uh, a note online of an indetermined uh, Tamistamine. Yeah. So false gharial from there. And at least two different types of terrestrial crocs. <gasps> Yay. Are known. There's Boverisuchus and Burgesuchus, both of which have been interpreted as terrestrial predators. Burgesuchus... Uh, is apparently not known from very much, but has been identified as a Sebekasukian. Nice. So these are, we've got aquatic crocs that were living like gators or caimans today, and then there were also land-dwelling predatory crocs at this time in this same place. Yeah, that's so fantastic. And they're preserved as wonderfully preserved remains like Diplocynodon, where it's a crocodile. Yes. Or an, in this case, an alligator type thing preserved in these wonderfully complete specimens with gut contents and stuff like that. No, if you see some of these specimens, like I said, the osteoderms are not just preserved, all there. Yeah, all over the end, like an armadillo, Mm -hmm. just there. So because of that fact, even more so than your average vertebrate, it just looks like the animal because it's not like... Oh, yeah, I can see, but it's got all the gaps where the guts aren't. You can't even right. see those gaps because it's all no. covered in just, osteoderms. Just looks like a gator. So it's the exact outline, <laughs> just missing eyes, basically. Very cool fossils, but even cooler. <laughs> now, here's the thing. <laughs> uh, the snakes are cooler than the crocs because uh, snakes are better than crocs in, in every way. But also, there has 
in particular, been a bunch of really cool discoveries and recent research on snakes at Messel, which is not why I chose this episode topic. <laughs> but as I was researching, I was like, oh, right. Oh, I'm going to get to talk about a bunch of snakes. And they fall into a similar category, as we were saying with birds and bats, that we don't typically get beautifully preserved snakes. Yes. We do. Often snakes are isolated bits like those other animals. Yep. At Messel, there are numerous specimens of just whole snakes. <sighs> that's that's so rid- and that's so many bones. <laughs> it is so much. It's just a, it's just a snake. It's just a whole snake laid out in the in the in the mud. There are, for example, uh, there's Eo Constrictor, who we have mentioned on the podcast, partially because Eo Constrictor. I I think we talked about a news where. Paleopython at Messel was re-identified as Eo Constrictor. Right, right. Yes. Uh, Eo Constrictor is an early boid, so or at least a boid, close to boas, known from a number of very, very well-preserved skeletons, whole skeletons. There has even been research looking at these skeletons and inferring the presence of pit organs oh. for infrared sensing, which might be, I can't remember if it is the oldest or among the oldest evidence of pit organs in snakes. Which are the organs they use to sense infrared uh, uh, light. Which makes sense, because, like, yeah, those pits are in the skull. Yep. There is also a famous smaller boboid named Mesolophus. <laughs> yeah, uh, I know. There, I've heard that name. Yes, you have. In fact, you've heard that name very recently, because we talked about Mesolophus in, a, in episode 154, because of a 2022 study that identified a specimen of Mesolophus with embryos inside of it. That's the one. That's the one. This was the the paper that identified the oldest known inferred live bearing snakes. <laughs> that these were this was a boid a, a boa of some kind with embryos inside that were late in their developmental stage and in the right part of the body to be getting ready to be birthed that were interpreted as the embryos of a live bearing snake. So cool. Which is an utterly ridiculous thing to be able to interpret from the fossil record. In addition to Mesolophus, there is also Mesolopython. <laughs> All right, guys. <laughs> which is... <laughs> which is a python, which itself is a very interesting thing, because boas and pythons are two different groups. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Today, boas live in the Americas, and pythons are found in the Old World, in Africa, Asia. Yes. They live very similar lives. They're very similar snakes, but they don't overlap today. Yeah. Uh, well, th- we've we've made them overlap. <laughs> but like, before we did that, boas and pythons do not overlap naturally in the world today. So the fact that they're both present at the Messel Pit is, is interesting because, number one, they overlap, two groups overlapping, uh, which is something we don't see today, but overlapping in a part of the world that neither of them lives in today. Yes, exactly. This is Europe. Yes. <laughs> this is overlapping in a tropical Europe. Which, which is, once again, just such a delightful aspect of the fossil record to where we have what is a oddly clean distinction between yeah. these two groups of snakes in the world today that because of how peculiar it is, it is very easy for one's brain to want to go, well, surely there's something to that. Right. They've like, never overlapped. Like they that, can't. Because that's that's too weird for there not to be some fundamental aspect to it. Right. And nope. 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 They just happened not to, but just they used to. how it ended up <laughs> while we were paying attention, but they used to be German. <laughs> and like with so many of the other animals at Messel, there are also examples of gut contents. I'm going to cite two examples uh, that are particularly exciting. A 1983 study reported a snake that they described as possibly a boid, so it sounds like they weren't able to uh, identify it further, that was approximately 1.8 meters long. Okay. So six foot long snake, and inside the snake was a half a meter long croc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which just makes Messel that much better. <laughs> so we have a snake wh- whose gut contents is a crocodilian. Yeah. Very, very cool. And the last example of a fossil that I'm going to mention from Messel, uh, which I, this is another one that I forgot that this was Messel. I, it wasn't in my brain when I started doing this until I came across and went, oh, right. Possibly my favorite fossil of all time. I have absolutely mentioned it here on the podcast before. This was reported in a 2016 study that identified a specimen of eoconstrictor. They call it paleopython, but this was before that was synonymized mm-hmm. with eoconstrictor. So this is the boid. 
with gut contents. And the gut contents inside the EO constrictor is a lizard called Gesaltalielis, which is a relative of modern basilisks. Right, right, right. Which is very cool. And the lizard has gut contents inside of it, the remains of some kind of insect. Yeah. It is a it is a fossil with three trophic levels preserved. It is a bug inside a lizard inside a snake. It is a fairy tale rhyme. Oh, no, yeah. Come to life as a fossil. This is the Messel turducken. It is so cool. It's very it's so cool. cool. If I remember correctly, I think that when it was published, it was it, they they cited that this is the third example of a three in one fossil, like of of an actually this ate this ate this. Yes fossil and i think the other two were both fish yes because i remember yeah I, I, one of them was a was a fish inside of an amphibian inside yep. of a fish and i think it's devonian yes and then i think the other one was like a fish inside of a shark inside of a fish or yeah. something like that yeah and i was talking to a colleague at the museum about this particular specimen and i said that uh, and their response was that's cool and all but those are fish. <laughs> the snake with a lizard and a bug in it is super awesome. And I said, that is correct. That is the correct response. Well, and like it, you're getting <laughs> such a, a wide variety of stuff. Yeah. It's... Well, and also they made a note in the paper that they, they described this and it's uh, look, I, I, as an editor would have accepted that paper. If the abstract was look at this. Yep. Look at this. There's just, Different pictures of the fossil. Just different pictures. Look at it. And the caption. Everybody, look at it. Figure one. Wow. <laughs> Scale bar equals one millimeter. <laughs> Just the whole paper. But they went further and they they they, went, they pointed out that this lizard is interpreted as being arboreal. Mm-hmm. Which might also tell us something about the snake and the bug. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this, this might be something that happened in the trees. Yes. And then <laughs> fell into the water. <laughs> yes. Or like crawled down to try to find a place to digest or something happened. Very cool. Well, it's so cool. It is one of my absolute favorite fossils of all time. Yeah. It is so neat. Well, and then like, I, I, I don't know what the basilisk lizard group is like. So I don't know if the aquatic connection with modern day basilisks is a feature but like they will do that where they will drop into the water Mm -hmm. to escape because they are good in the water they have the famous running across it but they can also just swim and whatnot right so it's a great escape for them so it could have also been a situation of that where maybe this this (laughs) it got a bug and then it tried to escape into the water yeah (laughs) (laughs) well and this was a boid and there are this is very this Mm -hmm. is very speculative there are boas that swim. Yeah, exactly. Anacondas are boas. Yep. So like, and eh. also apparently they were eating crocs. Yeah. <laughs> These were just listen. I have not mentioned any other specific animals uh, to dispute this in this episode. So I'm going to go ahead and say that the snakes were the apex predators <laughs> of the Messel Pit. Uh, you can't challenge me on that. You don't know. You didn't do any research for this episode. Snakes, Messel Pit. <laughs> A uh, world ruled by snakes. <laughs> it was it was it was a better time, a simpler time. <laughs> Simple is right. <laughs> we got rid of all the clutter. <laughs> yeah, right. It's really streamlined, as good as it could be. The Messel Pit is a fascinating fossil locality. Uh, I did not go through the rest of our episodes and count how many times we've mentioned the Messel Pit. I wouldn't do that. That mm-hmm. would be a lot of time that I would have to spend to do that. But, but if you listeners want to do that. If you want to do it, listen, <laughs> you want to tally it up, you let us know. It's a bunch. A oh, yeah. bunch of this stuff we've talked about before on the podcast, even if we didn't always mention that it was Messel. Oh, yeah. But some of the stuff I think has happened and we haven't even mentioned the Messel Pit. It was just, here's a cool fossil. It's like I, I, I remembered whilst we were having this conversation that I m- mentioned it in the Parasites episode. Yep. And I'm sure it came up in Bats. I don't recall specifically citing yep. Messel Pit, but it's surely of all yeah. the research. And the turtles. Yeah. Uh, I feel like that tur- the mating turtles either came up in episode 60, which was turtles, or maybe in episode 63, which mm-hmm. was sexual selection. Yeah. Uh, but I, it has come up before. So this is a fossil site that we cannot help but mention. Yes. On the podcast, it will come up more. And now when it comes up in the future, we'll have an episode to refer back to. Well, and like, go listen to episode 160. We're also in a position here where you know, a lot of the other extremely well-preserved sites we've talked about are older than this site, you mm-hmm. know? And so not only is this a really well-preserved site, but it's also a younger 
site and younger sites tend to have higher preservation rates because less has been able to happen to them. Well, they also have more familiar stuff. Mm -hmm. Like the Jehol Biota is really cool, but it's also it's a lot of dinosaurs and stuff. Yeah, it's a bunch of things that we don't know a bunch about. Like we don't know these turtles specifically, but we know turtle. We know snakes and crop like. A right. lot of these that are more familiar, a lot of the mammals are more familiar, so we can interpret them a bit more easily. Yeah. So, a very cool fossil site. There's way more oh, yeah. uh, to this. There's tons more that has been discovered. If you, dear listener, happen to be very familiar with discoveries of the Messel Pit, and Messel you know heads. of a fossil, Messel, Messel Heads, <laughs> and you know of a fossil that I didn't mention... Feel free to send us a to, to comment somewhere and, and let us know. If you'd like to learn more, there will be a blog post. And uh, this blog post will be full of cool pictures of Messel fossils uh, and links for more information. That will do it for our discussal. Discussal? Discussal. <laughs> discussal of the Meshin Pit. <laughs> for this episode. It's late. I'm not talking a lot. I've said the word messel a lot. Messel, 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 messel. We have one last thing to do, and that is our patron question. One of the benefits that patrons can get at a certain level on the Patreon is the ability to submit questions for us to answer here, right here on the podcast. Will, please read this episode's patron question. Our question is from Sam, who asks, As a kid, all my books said the KT event was 65 million years ago. Now it's the KPG and it was 66 million years ago. Do you know how the date was revised and why we no longer talk about the tertiary period? This is a great question. Yep. So, I even remember having a moment of that. Like someone was like 66. And I went, but is it? Yeah, same. <laughs> so this is the Cretaceous boundary. Mm -hmm. the, the, when the Cretaceous extinction happened, episode five, formerly uh, we, we used to call it the KT boundary. Mm -hmm. K for Cretaceous because of reasons <laughs> and T for tertiary, the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. And it was long cited as 65 million years ago. That was the Jurassic Park tagline. Yep, 65 million years in the making. It's also the name of that new movie that's out with Kylo Ren. Yep. These days, and in our episode about this, and every other time we've mentioned this extinction, it's the KPG, which stands for Cretaceous Paleogene, and it is 66 million years ago. Yes. Because it has shifted. This is actually a really good question. So I did a bunch of looking around to come up with an answer to this. This is a general answer. Yeah. So in terms of the dating, if you go back to the early 2000s and before that, the commonly cited date for the end of the Cretaceous was 65.5 million years ago. Yep, yep. And this was bet based on dating of various layers and, and correlations within the sediment. Most of the time in sort of colloquial everyday speech, People would just round that to 65. Yeah. Even though, if you remember your elementary school math, 0.5 means you should round up. You should. But it's totally understandable. 65.5, <laughs> you know, you're just shortening it. 65 is a more recognizable and pleasing number than 66. Yes. Because it's a five. This yeah. is just, you know, the weird psychology of humans. <laughs> As time went on, and especially around like 2010, sort of that area, around a decade ago, the dating of that boundary got better and better. And there's a lot of detail that goes into this. Part of that was because we had more more and more samples to test. We were able to identify more places where we might do, do dating, better stratigraphy. So we had a better understanding. Because in some places, we're not actually dating the boundary. Yes. They might be dating this ash layer that is four cycles under the boundary mm -hmm. and the cycles are interpreted to correlate with astronomical cycles uh you know orbital cycles and things like that so we're counting so it's this date minus this many yes of that cycle you know we're correlating the stratigraphy yeah if we figure out that this layer before or after it is actually this date but we still we haven't adjusted the distance between the layers that right. should then also adjust the layer of the KTPG. There has also been just improvements in certain dating methods. So uh, argon dating is right. what is often used, uh, especially around a decade ago, to secure the dating of the KPG. And that got better just in terms of being more precise in terms of dating. Yes. And so more recent studies found slightly later dates. 
And this was, you know, pushed from 65.5 to 65.9. Yeah, yeah. The most recent... Slightly earlier. Yes. (laughs) Slightly earlier, what Will said. (laughs) The most recent date that I have seen commonly cited comes from a 2013 paper that puts the date at 66.038. Okay. So, basically exactly 66 million years ago. Yep. So what happened is that our dating got more precise... And it pushed it half a million years earlier, but outside of the range where it made sense to round it anymore. Yep. <laughs> so like 65.9 no longer is nice and cleanly rounded to 65. Yes. Now, no, that's 66. And nowadays it is very much closer to 66. Yeah. Well, so, <laughs> like we said, the game, technically we should have been rounding to 66 yep. <laughs> since the beginning. <laughs> So we just got better at date. Our, our dating just got more precise and it shifted it ever so slightly. See that the, the 65 feels less like a rounding thing and more like a, at some point, some science news just didn't hear the last number or when I, it was 65 points on 65. All right. right. Or good enough. About 65. Yeah. I, yeah. 65 is a very, like I said, a pleasing number. Yes, exactly. So that shift has happened kind of over the last couple decades is that sort of, it, I think in 2004, the official sources were saying 65.5, and it has since been refined. Yeah. The tertiary has its own little history to it. So we used to refer to the uh, uh, most of the Cenozoic as the tertiary period. This came from a classification scheme introduced in the 1700s from an Italian geologist who classified geologic time into three chunks, the primary, the secondary, and the tertiary based on local rocks that he was studying. The tertiary was basically the Cenozoic era, uh, as we would call it today. Later on, other geologists added the Quaternary, yep. the fourth one, which is basically the Ice Age. As time went on, geologists found that this scheme didn't really work everywhere. Yeah. So they came up with other naming schemes and dividing schemes. And what happened is that primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary eventually all were dropped from official usage. Yep tertiary and quaternary both kind of stuck around in colloquial usage and then in 2009 quaternary was made official Mm -hmm. so now quaternary period is an official period on the geologic time scale it still basically means just the ice age whereas tertiary is in that sort of limbo where it is still used out of habit, but it's not actually considered official. Yes. Because it has been replaced by the Paleogene and Neogene periods of the Cenozoic. So tertiary used to refer to the time period of both of those. So the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. But as tertiary slowly fell out of favor in favor of the Paleogene Neogene, it became the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. There is incidentally an international union of geological sciences with an international commission on stratigraphy that decides these things. Yeah. This is very much uh, how we've talked a bunch on the podcast about how scientists will argue back and forth over taxonomic names because we want to find the most appropriate and fitting and suitable term to refer to this species or this family or whatever. Geologists do the same thing with the names and divisions of the geologic timescale. In fact, I found a 2012 article that I don't remember where this was published, but in the wake of the decision to formalize the quaternary period, this was an article written to argue the pros and cons of should we instate the tertiary period? Yep, yep. And it was a whole bunch of geologists who had come in to go, hey, we actually would like the tertiary period to be returned to formal usage. And then another group that came in and said, we don't think that it should be. And it was, a, you know, a back and forth. So this is something geologists have, were arguing about yep. as recently as a decade ago and probably much more recently than that. <laughs> Generally speaking, over the last few decades, I think tertiary officially fell out of usage in the 80s. Yeah. Um, and just gradually over time, it has kind of lost popularity in favor of paleogene, neogene. So what that kind of means is that the shift in age and the shift in name are happening eh, roughly around the same like this is this is a transition that is c- continuously happening yes during our lifetime yeah and it's so they're not when, when we were kids mm-hmm. it was the kt boundary and it was 65 million years ago yep 
but tertiary has continued to fall out of out of habit. It is no longer official, and the age has shifted. So it has made this little, very semantic but noticeable shift in how we talk about it. Well, and it's it's interesting that they're both shifting roughly at the same time, uh, but not because of like one no, unrelated, unrelated. It's just <laughs> unrelated reasons. Both adjusting and therefore changing two aspects, which. Uh, I had two funny observations. One that they're fairly minor things. Like, oh yeah, like this is happening constantly. Like this type of level of shifting and adjustment with our understanding of Earth's history is happening constantly across Earth's timeline. Just like with taxonomic names, Ab- all the time. Like, I just mentioned Eo Constrictor and yes. Paleopythons. Like, yeah, that happens constantly. Yeah, like there's there are conversations like that even with modern animals going on every day. Usually, though, it's so minor to where it's like, should this squirrel technically be a subspecies of this squirrel right. or should we consider it a sister species where it's not going to change anything about the people who see these squirrels in the park. Right. But this is just a scientific a distinction. Slightly just to the nitpick. So this is happening all over the place. The only reason <laughs> that it even is a conversation for anyone else is because it's the end of the Cretaceous. Because it is. it has been used in multiple movie yes. titles and taglines. Like, that's the <laughs> only well, it's, reason. It's the same way as we've talked about stuff with T-Rex. Yeah. Where, like, you'll get a study about T-Rex that is like, oh, some have suggested that there may be multiple populations or blah 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 it's like this is a very mundane kind of yes. scientific conclusion but it's happening with t-rex so Whoa. everyone's talking about it also the fact that the quaternary is currently the only one that has hung on gives me the, the star wars vibes of someone looking like why is there only one that has a sequential name yep. and it's like well it starts with four it would take way too long to explain that it's yep. it's super weird why why is <laughs> november not the ninth month yeah what happened yeah who messed that up? Uh, good old Julius uh, messed that up, apparently. It's, and in fact, that was part of the argument mm-hmm. in that paper is that they were like, well, one of the, one of the lo- logic, part of the logic behind not using the tertiary and quaternary anymore was because we got rid of primary and secondary, so they don't make sense anymore. And we were totally fine with that. But then you reinstated the quaternary. And if that's okay, mm-hmm. well, then why not the tertiary? So, yeah, it's it's all sorts of, like, very nitpicky semantic argument. Prequel fans versus original fans and stuff. But for the purpose of establishing consistency, mm-hmm. and that was one of the counter arguments, was they were like, here's a graph of the usage of these words over time. This is kind of happening anyway. These other terms are gaining more international popularity while the other one is losing international popularity. The point of this is not just, you know, when Star Wars fans argue about it, not to annoy all the Star Wars fans, uh, that's, that doesn't mean anything. No, that doesn't matter ever, (laughs) ever, ever. But here it, no, well, there is actually a functional intent here. Yes. To improve communication and to make this, uh, the most efficient and effective that it can be. Even if what that actually ends up meaning is just a bunch of semantic back and forth until something is decided. Yeah, well, that question has come up with uh, species names as well. Of like, mm-hmm. we th- we are realizing we should shift where this species is, but everyone knows this name because it's right. Triceratops or something well, like that. Well, it's Tyrannosaurus. <laughs> it's Tyrannosaurus because that. That is an example of where they made an exception to the rule. And they have to go, (laughs) it will be so monumentally more confusing to make the change that technically makes the most sense from just a pure logic standpoint. Right. By the rules. But language is not just a logical system. Language is about (laughs) communication and that you also have to take in consideration of, all right, but does anyone use tertiary except for the people who made this list of reasons to use the tertiary. Right. <laughs> like if, if the answer is no, then the Occam's razor. <laughs> so I think that this discussion is liable to get us hate mail from <laughs> tertiary fans and also Star Wars fans. Yeah. If you love so. the tertiary or episode three, <laughs> we, <laughs> we will happily, <laughs> we will debate you live on stage. No, we will not. We will not debate you. We will not entertain <laughs> That sort of nonsense. Thank you, Sam, uh, for that very insightful question. This has actually been a popular discussion recently Mm -hmm. because of the movie that's coming out. Yep, yep. 
is called 65 and I saw a bunch of dorks on Twitter. I mm-hmm. say that lovingly. Oh, yes. Who were like, oh, well, you shouldn't be meeting any dinosaurs, though, because yep. the end Cretaceous is 66 million years yep. ago. And there was someone who made a trailer like a, 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 a fan trailer. <laughs> it's just them walking around. That was a, a, a Adam Driver walking around with like the gun and everything, but they spliced in like early paleogene yep. mammals. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> As, yeah. Yeah. No, it would be funny to just have a, a, a paleontologist wide reaction of like, so what's the significance of the title? Like, I yeah. <laughs> what is that even? Oh, what what is, is it? Did something are, cool happen? Yeah. What are we referring to? I'm excited the... to find out. <laughs> So, uh, to answer your question, the date shifted because we got better and we we adjusted something by a tiny, tiny percent that happened to affect the number. That happened to affect a very famous. <laughs> and the name happened because scientists are constantly arguing and trying to decide the best way to do the words. Yeah, because deep down, we're just Star Wars nerds. Because we want to put it all in boxes and we got to decide the right boxes. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, This was a really fun episode. Really cool news discussions. uh, Really fun main episode topic. Really fun patron question. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to hear and engage more, there are all sorts of ways to do that. We have 160 episodes of this ridiculous podcast. Yep. Along with all sorts of other side projects and stuff. You can check all that out. There's even extra audio content on Patreon for our patron subscribers who get things like bonus news and bonus episodes of stuff like when we do our movie discussions, things like that. Check the episode description for all sorts of ways that you can engage with us. We've got all the social medias. We've got our Discord server where we do monthly Q&As. There will be one not long after this episode comes out. There's also an email address. There's a physical mailing address. There's a link to the Audible uh, free trials link where you can get yourself some books and also support us at the same time. Don't forget that we are appearing at ItsuCon. In the first weekend in April for all of those of you who might be around here in the East Tennessee area. We release episodes every fortnight without fail, rain or sleet or freato magmatic eruptions <laughs> here at the Common Descent Podcast. Stay tuned in a fortnight for episode 161, which is going to be super cool. I don't know what it's about, but it's going to be super cool. I remember what it's about. Uh, that has been decided. That, that is going to be a cool episode. Yeah. Uh, yep, yep, yep. I'm pretty excited about that. Um, it did. I did note that one of the things we talked about in this episode overlapped ever so slightly mm. with that topic in in one of my newses. Yep, yep, yep. And I went, while I was reading it, I was like, oh, I wonder if I wonder if Will's going to bring this up in yep. that episode. Potentially. I hadn't even considered that as a component for that episode (laughs) uh, because of all of the biases. (laughs) So we'll see if that happens. Yeah. Stay tuned to find out what the heck we're talking about. (laughs) Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.